I want to change one number. That's all I want to do. So why? Because as humans, we do two things. We postpone and we procrastinate. And what we've been doing on climate change is we've been postponing and procrastinating, right? So it used to be, let's stick at it one degree centigrade. And then it became, let's do it 1.2. And then let's do it 1.5. And the latest projections that we're seeing out of COP are two, 2.5, and at that point it's game over. And so what I wanna do is I want people to start thinking about what would it take to cool the planet by one degree centigrade. And that is a completely different goalpost, right? Because right now we're thinking about how do we moderate this curve, how do we slow it, how do we do this, how do we do that? But your notion as an engineer, your notion as an inventor, your notion as somebody who's trying to create something becomes a completely different animal if the question is how do we cool this? And you start coming up with solutions that nobody's come up with. And some of them are going to be car crashes in terms of, you know, as you game it out. But some of them may actually give you a very different notion, right? Because when you're doing that, you're refreezing areas. You're refreezing a part of Siberia, you're refreezing part of the Arctic, you're shutting down ocean lanes. You're doing a whole series of things that are a different order of magnitude. Why would anybody think of something so crazy? Because I want to talk about what's at stake in this stuff, right? Just to summarize three of the things that we've heard of that are changing climate. So the first is ice, the second is water, and the third is soil. Let me talk about ice for a second. So if you're really privileged, you get into that airplane and you fly out to Greenland and you watch the glaciers melt and you watch Greenland turn into Greenland, which it has never been, and you watch the water run off in Kangerlussak and you watch all of these lakes and all these rivers being formed on the ice. And, and you're just watching this stuff, right? But eventually you do get, oh, by the way, one of those glaciers melting is like a 4% rise in the ocean. So stakes are big on this stuff. And so what you do eventually is you fly out right in the middle of Greenland to that place called Engrip, and you land on ice. And the weird thing is you're out of breath because that ice is miles thick, right? So you're actually sitting really high altitude and everything under you is ice and the weird thing is that ice is moving. And that ice is moving faster and faster. And what you do is you camp out on the ice in these little tents, and hopefully a polar bear doesn't show up. And then you work out of that little geodesic dome and then you walk down into the ice. And under the ice, there's these giant caves. And what you start doing is you drill ice cores. And as you're drilling ice cores, then one of the things you begin to find is these little strips. And these little strips tell you a lot. So that's a volcano going off 21,000 years ago. And then as you keep going down, you keep finding these little strips, you see the first time that humans did iron, the first time they did bronze, the first time they did copper. And that's just the top of these little things, right? Because as you go deeper and deeper, what you're doing is you're creating these libraries of history. And each of these cores is connected to every other core. And you're going down like hundreds of thousands of years on this stuff, right? Big deal in, in Greenland, bigger deal in Antarctica. And here's what we've learned. So what we've learned out of this stuff is there, it is normal to exchange land and sea. And what I want you to see here is as CO2 goes down, sea levels go down. As CO2 goes up, sea levels go up. And it's you know pretty correlated across, oh, 500,000 years, just to pick a random number. But the scale on this thing is what is important. The scale on this thing is 150 meters. Not feet, meters, right? So, so what you're talking about is like exchanging 150 meters of stuff. And it happens several times. So ice, CO2 correlations are really important. The second thing is water, and we heard that because the water stuff is really important. And the core question here, the question we should all be asking is, if you have absolutely unprecedented levels of CO2 compared to that chart I showed you before, where CO2 and water level actually really trade off, how in the world can you put all the CO2 into there and not have the impact that you had 
on those charts of 150 meter sea level rise? And the answer is very thin atmosphere, and this shouldn't be called Earth, this should be a planet called water. And the important thing about this stuff is we've been studying primarily the air when we should have been studying, through Woods Hole, the water. And when you study the water, it turns out that water holds heat far better than air does. So let's put it in specific terms. You go to your stove, you turn on the stove, the flame is there, you put your hand above the flame, ouch, very quickly, right? Turn off the stove, put your hand above it, nothing happens, because it's dissipated. And then you put a little pot of water on it, and you watch it, and you watch it, and you watch it, and it doesn't boil until it does. But once that water boils, then try sticking your hand into it a minute later. It's really hot, and it will burn you. And so what's been happening in the ocean is it's been absorbing these absolutely massive amounts, like 337 zettajoules worth of energy. And that's why you haven't seen the atmosphere go to 50 degrees centigrade. And what's really important about this stuff is we may have already baked in at least a two meter sea level rise if we stop all emissions tomorrow. What I want to stress here is what I talked at the beginning. We have gone after climate scientists so hard with so much money that they have gotten really gun shy. And so every, you know, oh my God, this could happen high scenario has been exceeded time and again and again. And those actually end up being the most optimistic scenarios. Soil, last thing I'll talk about. It turns out that, you know, we're used to forests and we're used to farms, but a lot of the places where people don't spend a lot of time and don't live a lot are these big tundras. And these big tundras are deposits of peat. They're deposits of moss. They're deposits of organic matter. And so while agriculture has been producing a lot of socks and knocks, it turns out that there's something sitting underneath there that is really interesting. And this became very apparent to a friend of mine in Maine. So her teenage kid goes out into the forest, puts together a campfire, very careful under supervision, pours buckets of water onto the campfire, campfire goes out, not even smoking, they go away, 10 days later, fire chief calls. Your forest is on fire. What the hell? We put dirt on this, we put water on this, we put this out, but guess what? It didn't rain a lot in Maine this summer. So the stuff underneath the ground, the peat, caught on fire. And it caught on fire outside that pit. And that spread, and 10 days later, whoosh, damn forest went up, right? Now, that's a funny story, that's what happened on a big scale, except that that's what's happening in Siberia, and that's what's happening in Canada, and that's what's happening in all these places. The fastest heating areas in the world are setting up north, and they're heating much faster than it's heating here. And a lot of that stuff is organic stuff. And just as cows fart, so too do microbes. And as this stuff thaws, what happens is the microbes eat this stuff and they begin to fart. And they fart methane, which is 80 times per molecule for the first two decades what a CO2 molecule is. And so as you're looking at this stuff, this is what the permafrost looks like. This is the stuff that's melting, right? And so you're seeing the stuff up above and it goes way down and you're getting big fires in Siberia. Like really big fires. Like fires that make all the stuff that's going on in the American West look small. And this stuff keeps burning through the winter because it's all underneath and it's all still smoking and burning and fire. And so you're looking at 23 million hectares, 82 to 2020, half of that happening over the course of two years and accelerating. And so as you're looking at this stuff, one of the things you really don't want to do is you do not want to poke the climate beast. Because if you do, 150 meters of water can come back at you. And that's not a good scenario. So as you're fooling around with stuff like this, the other thing we learned in Greenland out of these ice cores 
is you can see really abrupt climate changes. Everybody's thinking of this as a linear system. Everybody's thinking about, you know, well, I'm going to be gone, and you know, maybe it'll affect my grandkids or my great-grandkids or somebody else. Well, no, actually, you can get a 10 degree increase in Greenland temperature in 50 years, and that's the equivalent of moving Minneapolis to Atlanta. And oh, by the way, in specific areas of northern Greenland, you can get what they call bowling warming. And what you're looking at is a step change in less than two years, where some of these northern sites went in terms of heat, five to 10 degrees centigrade per year. Right. These are not changes that occur once these tipping points happen. They do not occur linear scale. They occur on a step change scale, and they can make your life really miserable really quickly, because that's a thousand times faster than current warming. Our climate change models, the discussions at COP, are not looking at the ship. Pardon my French. So, my plea to everybody here is when we have these discussions, let's talk about what happens under normal circumstances, but let's also think about changing the goalposts to think about really taking down the temperature of this planet and not just moderating it as it goes up. And that requires just a completely different mindset. Very different projects from what you've seen here. But if we don't do that, the consequences of not doing that could be very different from the scale that we're thinking at today. Thank you very much.